Well, good morning. Uh, we'd first like to thank United Healthcare for providing our coffee for the people who attended the early Reveille session. And, um, and just as a reminder, we will have uh, another morning session at seven tomorrow. <clears throat> it will be a discussion on the military trauma cares learning health system and its translation to the civilian sector. Uh, it's gonna be a good lead in to the rest of the program tomorrow. So uh, please plan on, on coming to that. It starts at seven. If you're gonna be attending the banquet tonight, just a reminder, please bring your tickets with you. Following, following that early bird, we're gonna be starting out our plenary tomorrow. We've got the United Kingdom Major General Martin Brick now will be giving us um, some talks from uh, their um, lessons learned from some recent operations. So that should be exciting tomorrow. We've also got some other international presenters Friday afternoon. We will be running a clinical track. I know everybody likes to try to, to move along quickly on Fridays. Um, but we do have the Israeli Defense Forces and some more United Kingdom folks will be giving some, some presentations tomorrow. Um, so for those <coughs> um, interested, please stick around. We will have most of the presentations and whichever posters we have electronically, that we will have those posted on our website. It's gonna take us a, you know, probably a week or two to get them up there. So. Uh, but we will have a lot of the presentations up there. The, um, just a quick reminder, our membership booth is open today. Uh, wink, wink, nudge, nudge for those that want to join. Um, please do so today. And um, at this time then I'd like to have Dr. Cowan come up and introduce our uh, plenary session for the day. Good morning, everyone. Welcome back. It's good, good to see you here bright and early this morning. Um, I've, this has been an exciting meeting for me. Uh, and the plenary sessions have been very powerful. Uh, we started out on Tuesday with the keynote speaker hearing the viewpoint of Congress. Yesterday, we heard from the VA and the US Public Health Service where their future lies and where, where they're going. Today, we will dedicate the morning to the agencies of the defense health system. And tomorrow will be our, our capstone, in a way, because tomorrow we personalize all this. We'll have a panel discussion that will include patients and patients' families and their caretakers. And the theme is best described by, by uh, Colonel Greg Gadsden, who told me one day, he said, you know, I, I went through all of that treatment and rehab, and I, I used to be a wounded warrior. Now I'm me. Now I'm my new normal. And so we'll hear that and we'll feel that. And I think it's always important that we, we have our hearts touched as well as our intellect. I'm really excited about today. Uh, our speakers this morning just got what will probably be their marching orders, the draft of the NDAA 17, the long-awaited uh, congressional language uh, for the National Defense Authorization Act. It's uh, apparently a lengthy tome, and nobody has digested it or come close yet but there, there were lots of eyes kind of spinning around in the speaker ready room for, after, uh, after uh, being absorbed by what their future looks like. So I think we'll catch a glimpse of that. And I, I think it's a great honor for all of us that this morning we will be uh, addressed by the equivalent of an 18 star general. Uh, if, you, if you add up all the stars, our host and uh, first speaker, Dr. Karen Geis, is the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs, and she's the four-star uh, equivalent on the panel. This is her panel, and so Dr. Geis, without further comment from me, I will turn it over to you, and thank you so much.
Thank you, Admiral Cowan. And, and so he just finished declaring me in charge. I'm gonna shake things up. And we've done things a little differently for this uh, series of talks. And I'm going to ask uh, General Caravalla, who's the Joint Staff Surgeon, to kick it off with his speech. Well, good morning, uh, Dr. Geis. Thanks for uh, uh, deferring uh, to me to uh, uh, lead this uh, talk. Uh, was very clearly, if we went uh, by order of rank, I'd uh, be speaking at 2 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, so if I can go to the uh, first slide. Uh, or am I going to control this from here, I believe? Uh, I'm going to start with a disclaimer and a disclosure. The, uh, even though I'm here in... Uh, in uniform and uh, from the joint staff, I am speaking on my own behalf. I don't, rep my views don't necessarily represent those of the joint staff or the United States Army. And uh, along with that is a disclosure that, uh, that AMSIS has asked us to uh, put out. So these views are purely uh, my own and not of, uh, of, of anyone else. I wanted to start off with uh, my responsibilities uh, to the chairman and uh, to kind of lay out for you, you know, we, we just heard that we uh, uh, will get uh, uh, stat statutory guidance from NDA if it, if it gets uh, signed and then uh, signed by the president uh, of the way in the future. But I, what, what I want to talk about is how does the executive branch uh, work? How do we end up with our marching orders? And you'll see this nested all the way down to how the services are then uh, executing uh, the directive of the uh, president. Um, and I, I had a slide there with the chairman. Our chairman is the 19th chairman, uh, General Dunford, United States uh, Marine Corps, uh, four-star general, previous uh, uh, commandant of the Marine Corps. He's uh, started his second year of his uh, first two-year term uh, as our chairman. Uh, just uh, by way of background, the duties of the chairman were put in place in 1949 uh, by Congress, and then the, those uh, the, the guidance for the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff was refined in 1986. And if you remember what happened uh, before that, uh, we had a number of incidents, a number of operations where we showed and demonstrated that the services, although uh, proud in their own right, uh, were independent and unable to work together in a critical operational setting. And so the uh, NDA at the time, uh, uh, what, was, what is now known as the Goldwater Nichols Act in 1986, uh, created uh, uh, a refined marching orders for the uh, chairman, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and for the Joint Staff, uh, creating what would uh, then become an interoperable uh, uh, force moving over the years now to become interdependent uh, and then uh, there's a possibility in the future that we could transcend that even uh, further. The bottom line for the chairman is uh, that he provides best military advice to the President of the United States and to the Secretary of Defense. So the, the big the buzz phrase where I work is BMA. Whatever is going on, is this going to provide BMA for the chairman uh, to tell the President? So by extension, my responsibilities to the chairman is to provide him best military medical advice. So everything I do is uh, with that focus in mind. And that focus then is on the best military advice in support of the joint force in the operational setting, wh whether at home or abroad, but how are we gonna, how are we gonna employ our forces in a joint force uh, setting under a joint force uh, commander in support of the command commanders uh, anywhere in the globe. And then the, in addition to the best military medical advice, what I do then by essence, in essence is I am the global synchronizer for all health services uh, employed in the operational setting. And if I were to put that into a tagline, uh, the joint staff is the connective tissue between the services, the combat support agency, uh, and the command commands. And you can see there the areas under which then I oversee. What I want to do for today's talk is, is kind of show you how the joint staff, under the direction of the chairman, establishes strategy and how we establish joint doctrine. So basically two lines, one is strategic documents and the other then are concepts, concept documents. The main document uh, that the president signs by direction of the Congress uh, to be uh, published periodically is the national security strategy. 
With the national security strategy, in general terms, the president lays out his strategic uh, focus or foci for the, for the uh, ensuing years uh, and the requirements for that. And that generates a starting point for Congress and the president and his or her administration to then speak about resourcing so that uh, those two arms of uh, our, um, our government can then work together to, to get after this problem set. Based on the national security strategy, nests all things uh, then incumbent upon the DOD to perform in, in that regard. Congress has also mandated that the chairman uh, write periodically, usually in the, in the even years in February is a, is, is a statute, then publish a national military strategy. And that's what I'm depicting here, the last uh, published uh, document that, you, that the general public has seen uh, and there's one that's being um, pushed out here this month, uh, a, a new NMS. But that is the first uh, and top document that the chairman then uses, along with his annual chairman's risk assessment that generates um, strategy for the services to nest uh, uh, their, their subsequent strategies. And that also allows the chairman to, with those two documents, CRA and, and the NMS, to, to do what we call setting the globe. So that year after year, the chairman can then look at what are the critical elements impacting uh, the globe, and then he can assign and allocate forces uh, against that. On the right-hand side, you're looking at uh, uh, the parent document under the chairman's family of documents that gets after joint doctrine. And that gener those are the concepts uh, under which the services will then align their concepts and how they will then uh, uh, align, organize, train, and equip uh, to get after uh, force provision in support of the joint force when, when called upon to do so. What I'm showing you here in a single slide, uh, just in the interest of time, is how all this is, is uh, laid out. And at the very top, you'll see the capstone concept for joint operations, this is the, the parent document that I was, to which I was referring. Under that, you see six lines, operational lines. Those are the major, when you talk about the spectrum of operations, those are the major types of operations that the joint force uh, speaks to. So th that's uh, cooperative security, reading from left to right, deterrence operations, irregular warfare, major combat operations in a joint operational area, stability operations, and then homeland defense and civil support. So those are under the capstone concept, those are the joint operating concepts speaking to the six lines, main, uh, main types of operations that the, that the US military conducts. Now this further refined under with supporting joint concepts, what I have in blue for those lines that require additional um, clarification uh, to execute those. And what you see is foreign internal defense, deter terrorist networks, and unconventional warfare in our special operations lines. And JCEO stands for the joint concept for entry operations, what you need uh, a forced entry situation before you conduct major combat operations, which uh, very often goes hand in hand. Now you have uh, uh, additional uh, supporting concepts that speak to um, uh, support across all lines. And that kind of makes sense, whether it's logistics, cyber, uh, uh, things of that nature. And under the tenure of General West, uh, when she was the uh, Joint Staff Surgeon, published uh, in uh, uh, last year was uh, a great move, and that's the Joint Concept for Health Services. So that got medical online at the Joint Staff, got us the recognition I think is critical uh, to then uh, acknowledge for the, for the Chairman and the Joint Staff and DOD to acknowledge that the medical has a play across the spectrum of operations and in it describes everything that, that we do. And that's, those kinds of documents are critical for our future relevance uh, in what we do uh, day to day. 
But that in lies, uh, what I tried to do here is just show you how concepts are laid out and how we get to do what we, what we uh, do um, on a day-to-day -day basis. So let's uh, talk a little bit about the, the concept side uh, in, in my last uh, 10 minutes here. So uh, going back to the capstone concept for joint operations, that looks about five or 10 years and kind of uh, describes what the future will look like. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking about the security environment of the future. But if you were to distill this concept document down to one tag phrase, that is globally integrated operations. And that is a relatively new concept. And that speaks to a security environment that is not regional. That we're gonna have to think about um, engaging an adversary, a, con uh, um, uh, a contestant, uh, a counter, uh, uh, or a, uh, an enemy um, in a, on a global fashion. So the chairman wants us to think along those lines. There are eight elements of GIO, but I highlighted for you the things that I thought might impact the medical community more, and I just show you this just for, for completeness. But basically, uh, we're gonna have to be agile, innovative, we're gonna be small unit, uh, uh, and we're gonna have to think outside the box. Take another uh, uh, sister document now, the Joint Operating Environment 2035. So by definition, this look, looks out 20 years, and it tries to describe the security environment uh, that we might see, and the challenges that we might face, and the conflicts that we might engage in, uh, so that we can prepare for that. It, you can say, well, what about the opportunities and the positive things and things that may not happen? So because we're the DOD, we really don't focus on the, on the happy side of things. We prepare for what could go wrong that the president may ask us to engage, and we focus, we focus on that. And this will allow then the services, as they uh, uh, then become uh, force providers to the joint force, to know how to shape, how to, in how to uh, organize, how to train, how to equip their forces so that they are uh, meaningful and uh, helpful in the, to the joint force command, to the command commander. So if you were to distill these issues down off of the Joe 2035, the security environment, uh, we, we talk about it uh, in the term TMM, that we can expect the future security environment to be trans-regional, again, global, no longer within the confines of a geographical combatant command. So we'll ex it's gonna be global. It's gonna be uh, multi-domain, so no longer the historical air, land, sea space. Add to this now cyber, and coming to a theater near you soon will be human domain. You, see, you start to see inklings of human domain, human dimension. There's just a little work on that. Cyber was that way a little bit. There have been so many attacks in the cyber world that now we're stepping up and, and, and <clears throat> more formalizing uh, that uh, entity to the point where it may be a uh, four-star unified command uh, in the near future. Human DMA may take the same uh, shape. I'd ask that the medical community watch that very closely. We may not lead that, but, I, uh, but we should be the 800-pound gorilla SME that helps to inform that when that comes around. And then multifunctional, and from the line leaders, they're talking about it, uh, we may have miss missile defense operations going on and major combat operations going on in, in the same time. You have to be able to operate on many functional levels at the same time. Medically translated in my mind, we may be involved with what some people call global health engagements, what I call medical civil military operations one day, and the next day I may turn that unit around and ask them to be conducting uh, damage control resuscitation for major combat operations. We can expect the whole spectrum of adversarial uh, interplay uh, with efforts short of war, all the way to overt combat operations. And we can expect this to be normal and recurrent. And by that, I mean uh, that we can expect an enduring engagement uh, requiring DOD forces uh, operating across the globe. The sites may change, and they may change month by month or year by year, but I expect there'll be an enduring requirement. We will not enter a quiescent interwar period, I believe. And the requirement is gonna come from not conventional forces,
but saw forces. And if you look at your old plans, if you look at your doctrine now, you're not going to find it on there. So this is one of those things where, where reality is outpacing doctrine. And this is a time for us to acknowledge the reality, look at our capabilities, identify the gaps, and then maybe uh, relook our doctrine to follow. Under this, as I mentioned before, the Joint Concept for Health Services, this, uh, then the tagline that goes with this is Globally Integrated Health Services. 16 uh, required capabilities. I just uh, throw this out here for completeness. But in it, uh, under General West's uh, tutelage, uh, we really are covering soup to nuts. So there's some home station uh, efforts there, home and employed, and then fully employed. But this, this puts forward to the chairman, these are all the things that we do. And what we don't want uh, as a medical community is to be operating in a black box that we want the joint force to acknowledge that this is what we do on behalf of the joint force. So what's the impact of all these concepts on the med force? We anticipate a big environmental change. There may be future wars uh, revolving simply around access to water. The impact of uh, uh, global warming may impact DMBI on our own forces or where we're, we're involved whether natural disasters uh, 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 come from these global warming types of changes. Domain dominance, we'd have to be able, we must be prepared to operate in a domain constrained environment. And that means we may not have air superiority or it may mean that we have no internet. We'll have to do small units, smaller than what I see doctrinally from the Army, Navy, and Air Force currently, smaller, more modular. Focus on self-propelled uh, elements, I think, are a thing of the past. And then we must be prepared to fight in areas that we've not fought before. And the most difficult uh, scenario that I can imagine is an urban megacity situation defined as 10 million people in a city, city uh, urbane setting. All right, operational considerations, more, uh, these are just some of my thoughts of what this may mean for the services and how they focus in the, in the future to support the requirements coming out of the command commands. Some things that we might have to look at is extending the reach of our providers, our clinicians, our ability to resuscitate. We may have to empower those who don't have those skill sets now. We may have to extend the reach through telemedicine and telehealth we may have to use autonomous evacuation. We'll have to be non-doctrinal for some period of time. I, I do um, uh, ask uh, strongly of the services to look uh, to do this. Combine operations, joint meaning among services, combined meaning uh, among nations. That's gonna be the way of the future, but not only in the combined operations, we're going to be reliant on uh, transnational uh, organizations, NGOs as well. Some home station considerations, uh, having come from the uh, research community, um, and we talked about uh, combat casualty care research line and the military operational uh, uh, op uh, research line. I think uh, it may be worth looking uh, to change some of that. Change it to, to brain fitness so that we can encompass home station and employed injury, concussive injury, or uh, uh, psychological uh, impacts of, of uh, service. Military trauma, I think, is a less uh, loaded uh, statement. Military trauma allows us to continue to do research uh, and get support uh, to, to touch a number of things. Combat casualty care can still be under that. And you can see some of these other things where I think we need to continue our work. How do we maintain our, our skills in burn management, trauma management, prosthetic management? A lot of folks are asking us to do that. Uh, that's a premium that's gonna be need, needed to be paid for use at some point in the future. That's gonna be something the services are gonna have to think through. 
Uh, and th that's kind of how I wanted to highlight, uh, to, to set the stage from the joint force uh, in, in our responsibility to set joint doctrine and requirements and capabilities for the joint force in this inner connectivity, connective tissue, if you will, that will then drive uh, how missions are done uh, and executed uh, at the levels to follow under, under the chairman of the joint staff. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thanks, uh, General Caravallo, that was great. Um, I probably should tell you kind of the strategy for our plenary session since I didn't do that when I got up here the first time. So in the words of uh, uh, Doug Robb, uh, General Robb, um, go big to small. So what we want to do today is sort of paint um, a picture for you that starts with the very broad aspects of what the department does and then gets, uh, with each sub uh, subsequent talk, gets a little bit more focused on on specific roles and responsibilities within that framework and, and kind of the totality of what we do in the military health system. Um, only you, the audience, will know if we actually did that. So, um, so my talk is on raising the bar. You can see the title there. I'll explain that in a minute. But I first want to say good morning and welcome to day four of AMSIS. Uh, I would first like to thank the, uh, Dr. Cowan and the AMSIS leadership and the wonderful staff for a job well done in delivering this year's conference. I would also like to thank General Edinger for his leadership in uh, setting the theme and overseeing the very hard work of putting on a conference of this size. So thank you very much. As you all know and have seen multiple times now, I hope, uh, the words used for this year's theme of the AMSIS conference are raising the bar. This is a clear reference to process improvement, and the theme has been very, very, very visible throughout the many presentations and breakout sessions this week. As most of you know, I'm a strong proponent of process improvement through measurement and accountability. However, on occasion, I like to puzzle over words and how we use them. For example, the word execute is frequently heard in the military, yet it had a very different meaning during the French Revolution. <laughs> I know, it's a bit quirky, uh, playing with the meaning of words or phrases, but it does pass the time during those endless meetings in the Pentagon. It, <laughs> it also makes giving speeches a bit more fun, certainly for me and hopefully for you. With respect to the title of this year's AMSIS conference, it was the word bar that intrigued me. The word bar can mean a lot of things, such as construction, gymnastics, physical barriers, the ballet, the practice of law, and yes, the place where adult beverages are served, and I know you went there first. <laughs> but did you know that each of these types of bars is relevant to the military health system? The rest of my talk will tell you why I think so. First, construction. You cannot build a building without a bar of some sort, concrete, steel, or wood. And you can't tell where the bar goes without a blueprint or a plan based on existing standards and the actual purpose for the building. Drafting a plan takes technical skills based on a vision of the possible and the agility to change the plan to address unforeseen complications, changing attitudes and perspectives, and to overcome new challenges. Building requires a variety of skills and talents, carpenters, plumbers, electricians, and sometimes engineers to ensure that the building can withstand an earthquake. Good planning, good plans take time to develop. Great plans may take even longer. The time spent building the building varies as well. The Giza pyramids took 20 years, as did the Taj Mahal. Some buildings, like the US Capitol here in Washington, DC, were built, burned, rebuilt, 
and remodeled over time to accommodate growth, circumstances, and changes. And we've all watched as entire buildings are occasionally demolished to make way for progress. One thing is clear in construction. Build carefully, with clarity of purpose, using the right materials, but be open to necessary change from new requirements to the new architect's change of perspective, and to never forget that all construction should be fully funded. The military health system is our building, based on a plan with many requirements and needs. The first such requirement is to provide medical support to combatant commanders, when and where needed, in the quantity and type to complete the mission. This plan requires the appropriate materials in the form of properly trained and deployable medical personnel, along with the appropriate equipment. The implication is clear. Operational plans drive the requirements for medical support. Combatant commanders simply expect deployment-ready medical forces to execute the medical responsibilities within those plans. Deployment-ready medical forces may require specific training, military or medical, against a backdrop of skills that must remain sharp and practiced. We know that our system of care is one provided largely to a younger population and that, as a result, we're unlikely to keep all of our medical skills as sharp and practiced as they could be. We must first define with clarity for all military medical personnel those deployment-ready skills that must be maintained at all times. Together, we've moved in this direction by defining essential deployment medical capabilities and, for the first time in one known downrange skill set, that of general surgeons, the necessary deployment knowledge, skills, and abilities based on the hard lessons of real combat experience. Other groups of military medical personnel, anesthesiologists, general internists and family practice providers, intensive care nurses, virtually anyone who can and should be part of the medical support for an operational plan must do the same. I ask that you do it quickly, professionally, and with precision. These KSAs will be used to report the deployment readiness of military medical personnel within the department's readiness reporting system and will help the department, civilian and line leaders alike, better understand what it takes to maintain operational medical readiness. We must not, we must not stop at simply defining deployment ready standards. We must ensure that we have a system that allows our military medical personnel to maintain those standards. One, stat one strategy is to recapture retiree care into the direct care system, and we've had some success in doing so. Another strategy is our strong partnership with the VA, and we've made good progress in streamlining the way we pay each other for the health care rendered in our facilities at the national level. We are closely working with the VA to ensure that veterans can, can be seen in our direct care system more easily. We have existing sharing agreements to provide patient care and are evaluating where it is appropriate to renew those agreements or enhance veteran access by becoming choice providers. One thing is clear. We want to care for our veterans and we welcome them into our clinical services. A third strategy is to partner with other healthcare systems where our military medical personnel could work across and access a broader variety of clinical scenarios and problems than typically seen in our system of military hospitals and clinics. The service surgeon generals already do this to some extent, although their approaches differ a bit. This slide shows some of the folk associated with the Cincinnati Sea Stars program used by the Air Force. Once the KSAs have been fully defined, I believe the opportunities for enhancing and maintaining deployment-ready skills will become readily available and evident, and that the private sector will embrace more strategic partnerships to help us. How do I know this? I know this because wherever I go and to whomever I speak, people are proud of the achievements of the military health system, your achievements, and they want to help in any way they can. Taking good care of our men and women in uniform is not a blue or a red issue. It's an American issue. 
Other opportunities to hone deployment-ready medical skills include strategies to use our reserve military medical personnel in different ways, or more precisely, strategically maintain certain types of deployment-needed skills predominantly in the reserves. Neurosurgery, cardiovascular surgery, certain orthopedic skill sets come immediately to mind. These would be those skill sets where we know we can't maintain sufficient volume and complexity of cases in our direct care system, nor can we pro provide them through strategic partnerships. These strategies need more work and thought, but should be pursued. Our MHS building plan also includes a requirement to provide health care to our beneficiaries using our own system of hospitals and clinics supplemented by the TRICARE system when and where it is needed, particularly in the so-called white space between MTFs. For too long, TRICARE seemed like another business line or a floor within our building, a floor seemingly isolated from the others with only a hidden staircase and for which no one could find the key. No longer. The T2017 contract was designed to better support the requirements and needs of the direct care system while improving our defined health benefit. The services provided medical experts who contributed and collaborated with the TRICARE experts and acquisition experts to define contract specifications that will improve care and provide all of us with the assurance that those using the TRICARE network are receiving the right care delivered safely and in accordance with the highest standards of quality. This collaboration must continue with the agility to adapt to changing medical practices and to adjust to the overall larger healthcare marketplace particularly when new opportunities present themselves. Other designated rooms in our MHS building are for responding to humanitarian and disaster missions, whether it is to help those impacted by tsunamis, hurricanes, or floods, we have the capability, the knowledge, and the training to respond when asked for assistance. Nowhere was this more evident than when the department responded to the call for help during the West African Ebola crisis. I think, that this was the time the entire force of the force came together for me in a real and tangible way. I watched from week to week as the plans came together, together, carefully built and layered to craft a response that was complete, safe, and timely. From the development of policy to the best place to land an airplane, the department rose to the occasion as it does every single time men and women of the armed services are called upon. The final room in our MHS building is for our international partners. Think of it as the living room where we might greet our guests with coffee or tea. Of course, it's much more than that. It's about learning and sharing, from each, sharing with each other. Experiences from the last 15 years have shown us how good we can be together in solving medical problems on the battlefield. After all, once you're in scrubs with cap and mask, we all look pretty much the same to the patient. Building on these shared experiences is critical for the future when we once again will share the battle space. From medical education and training opportunities to sharing the results of our research, continuing to build on these strong relationships will serve us well into the future. We also have opportunities to work within other parts of our own government in a whole of government approach to improve our collective global health security. This initiative has grown legs, and while still relatively new, we have seen other countries recognize both the threats and the opportunities in collaborating around this issue. It simply makes good sense. It makes even better sense from a force health protection perspective. Fewer endemic infections mean fewer exposures for our people, and preventing Preventing epidemic outbreaks of disease is a far better strategy than trying to control them after they've occurred. I think we need to work more on this initiative together as the military health components of those countries participating in the global health security agenda. We need our own action package that will help us define the very specific contributions and tasks for military medicine and help show others how an integrated approach can achieve results faster. We have much to offer and much to learn. I do want to thank those military medical leaders who came such a long way to be with us this week. The relationship between and among us is mutually beneficial and a lasting one. Of that, I am certain. But like all relationships, it will take ongoing work and dialogue. 
Okay, that's almost it for construction. What you're now gonna watch is 11 years of construction for the new Freedom Tower in New York played in 56 seconds. All good construction needs a plan. That blueprint to guide the placement of beams, piers, and walls. A plan that makes sure the weight of the structure is properly distributed. That doors and windows are in the right places. That each and every person involved in the project knows and understands their particular role and responsibility. The ultimate result is a building that not only looks like the three-dimensional replica of the plan, but one in which all involved can look back with pride and say, I helped build that. And if only Milcon were as uh, efficient in 56 seconds. Okay. All right, we have over the past years created concept and ideas and actions that created our MHS blueprint, some of which I've just discussed. It's critical for the success of the MHS to continue this work together. Next up, gymnastics. Every four years, we watch our Olympic athletes compete on bars, parallel or uneven. They thrill us with their abilities to move quickly and surely through their routines, holding us in awe and just a touch of fear should they fall. Their talents are related to their strong desire to compete and win. But grounded in the reality of years of practice, 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 and supported by careful coaching with the right resources. You, the people who make up the military health system, are much like these Olympic gymnasts. Over the last many years, we have seen our colleagues compete in combat zones to save lives and practice, practice, practice until they created a system of combat casualty care unparalleled in achieving results. They, like the Olympic athletes, are supported by the right policies that coach behavior along with the resources to both deliver care and to continuously push the research envelope to find new and better ways to improve that care. The warfighter benefits, the American people benefit from the investment in our people, their training, and their strong desire to compete and win. Many of the attributes of gymnasts were recently highlighted in a National Academy of Medicine study. Let me read you part of the report's conclusion, and I quote, improving trauma care will require an unprecedented partnership across military and civilian sectors and a sustained commitment from trauma system leaders at all levels. The benefits are clear. The first casualties in the next war would experience better outcomes than the casualties of the last war, and all Americans would benefit from the hard-won lessons learned on the battlefield. I urge you all to read it. The third bar I will talk to you about is the one representing physical barriers. These types of bars are usually used to protect us from a known or perceived hazard, such as when we use safety gates to prevent toddlers from falling down a flight of stairs. Sometimes physical barriers are only temporary, and other times they're not needed at all. We in the MHS have organizational silos serving as our physical barriers to conversation, collaboration, cooperation, and coordination. These silos act much like a building whose rooms lack interconnecting doors or even doors to a common hallway. You're probably thinking she means the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force, but I also mean the Defense Health Agency and even the Office of the Secretary of Health Affairs. But other silos exist too. They spring up much like pop-up stores and appear along organizational lines. Even cross-service working teams can be easily entrenched in their to-do list and forget to look over their self-imposed parapet. When I attended the Duke Institute for Public Policy, one of our required readings was the book, The Wisdom of Teams, Creating the High Performance Organization by John Katzenbach and Douglas, Steve, Douglas Smith. If you've not yet read it, I urge you to do so. For those of you who have read it, let me remind you what the authors conclude after reviewing a number of companies who succeeded or failed based on the strength or weakness of the team. Commitment to performance goals and a common purpose is more important in team success than team building. Opportunities for teams exist in all parts of the organization. Real teams are the most successful spearheads of change at all levels. 
Working in teams naturally integrates performance and learning. Team endings can be as important to manage as team beginnings. And so what have we done to power the harness, harness the power of our own teams? Over the last several years, we have viewed ourselves as a single enterprise with valued and important differences. We created the Defense Health Agency in order to harness the strength and economies of sharing common services, including information technology, contracting, pharmacy, the TRICARE Health Plan, education and training, research and development, public health, facilities, and logistics. These teams of military and civilian personnel work side by side to support the services. They also work in the same place, the Defense Health Headquarters shown on this slide. Granted, the DHA is not yet perfect, nor will it ever be. But isn't that part of raising the bar? There's always more work to do, and higher levels of performance are always possible. We have also reformed the way we govern our business by establishing a series of boards with delegated authorities. This new structure creates opportunities for conversation, discussion, and accountability. When the working groups are tied to governance and information is shared, along with a clearly defined vision of where we need to go, we necessarily break down these silos and can, and can raise the bar for all. We must continue to work in a more cross-functional manner to create teams that, create, that deliver results and continue to contribute to a stronger NHS enterprise that delivers higher and higher levels of performance. Our patients expect it, our combatant commanders demand it, and our country values it. So when raising the bar, just remember, the bars don't go between us. On to ballet as my fourth example of relevant bars, this time spelled with two R's and one E. Okay, I know you're all thinking, how possibly can she relate ballet practice bars to the military health system? Ballet dancers, like gymnasts, must practice diligently at their craft. Their practice routine begins with exercises at the bar, a wooden beam running around the ballet studio and used to support the dancers through their warm-up exercises. Bar work is always, done to performing, is always done prior to performing center exercises, after which the performers will exercise and rehearse for specific ballets. Now you might say, Dr. Geis, you're double dipping. You just talked about gymnasts, and ballet dancers are pretty much the same, right? Not really. Although they do share certain characteristics, and both have to work at their craft, but gymnasts are about power and competition. The ballet is about telling a story. From Cinderella to Don Quixote, A Midsummer Night's Dream, and Swan Lake, ballet dancers use graceful movements to interpret stories, usually accompanied by an orchestra. The dancers are on point, but stories must be on point. The MHS is full of stories. Some we have experienced ourselves, others we have only read about. Still others are quietly held within, waiting for the perfect telling opportunity. And yes, I have three stories to share. One is I read about in Newsweek. The story is called Out of the Valley of Death, and it occurred in Afghanistan. It's the story about a four-person army medevac team. During a mission and under enemy fire, one member of that team, Sergeant Bringlow, Sergeant Bringlow was coming back up the hoist to a dust off at 75 when a gust of wind pushed her and the soldier she had rescued into a dead pine tree. She protected her patient using her body to block the impact, got her patient into the chopper and back to the Roll 2 facility safely. A total of 14 soldiers were rescued by the team of four over the next three harrowing days. Only then did Sergeant Bringlow think to take care of herself and her broken femur that resulted from her encounter with that pine tree on the first day. The next story is about Navy Captain Peter Ree, now simply Dr. Ree, who, when he left military service, set up shop in Tucson, Arizona. Once there, he helped the community establish a trauma response system based on his war experience, a trauma system that became front page story on every paper in America following the mass shooting where Congresswoman Gabby Giffords was wounded. It was his battlefield experience that made a real and tangible difference to that community 
and to Congresswoman Giffords. And there's the quiet story, the one that's yet to be told, that each and every one of us could tell. Mine is about the wonderful people that I work with every day, who come to work and simply do their job. They are the backbone of our organization, and their story will never be captured in the headlines. Yet there are also heroes, for without these folk, we could not do what we need to do. That meaningful work that raises the bar for each, each and every day, making us stronger and better for the, for the, to solve the problems of today and prepare for the challenges of tomorrow. Learning how and when to tell our stories requires effective communication, and telling stories well is one of the most effective communication strategies. By connecting our stories to the world around us, helps others understand the demands, sacrifices, and glories inherent in military medicine. We must continue to work on telling our stories, particularly the ones that tell the world how we are raising the bar. And now to the practice of law. In law, the term bar has two principal meanings. It refers to the legal profession as an institution and also to that imagined line which separates trial participants, judges, lawyers, and jury from the spectators. As part of a federal agency, the MHS is governed by laws that are implemented by regulation and policy. Every year we're provided with new laws that change the way we do business. Sometimes we request changes because we see a better way but lack the appropriate authorities to implement new, a, good, a new good idea or to change an outway, outmoded way of doing business. Other times, stakeholders ask for specific changes in order to solve problems or correct perceived def uh, deficiencies. And the dance of legislation begins. And by the way, that book by Eric Redman was another required reading in policy school. I recommend it to you as well. Many of you have been eagerly been waiting the 2017 NDAA, or maybe not so eagerly. Uh, and it is finally here with 150 pages full of reform for the military health system within a 3,000 page bill. But since it only arrived yesterday at noon, I have not completed my review and cannot share my findings and thoughts with you quite yet. Over the next few days, we will know if first if the bill passes and second if it's accepted by the president. During that same period, the MHS leadership will be meeting to puzzle through the meanings of, meaning of specific words and the intent of Congress. So more to come here. And finally, the one you've all been waiting for, bars associated with adult beverages. While this may be everyone's pref preferred bar, I do not intend to dwell on the wide variety of venues and types of adult beverages, nor do I intend to give you my recipe for eggnog, even though it's the holiday season. What we see in bars is generally people behaving in many ways, dancing, talking, sitting alone and apart from the crowd, and yes, the occasional brawl. Over the years, I've worked for a variety of people, and those people demonstrated a number of behaviors, some good, some not so good. My observation was that leaders' behavior impacts the entire organization as children model the behavior of their parents. How we behave depends on a number of factors, as we all know based on our own individual experiences, and behaviors do matter for raising the bar. Researchers have spent years examining behaviors and performance with a goal of finding the secret sauce used by effective leaders. This work has generated a new understanding of what creates good, a good leader, and I would argue a good follower as well. Turns out we all have something called emotional intelligence that affects how we approach life, both personally and professionally, from making decisions to navigating social complexities. It is how we turn our emotional intelligence into behavior that becomes the secret sauce. The good news is that since we all have emotional intelligence, we can learn to use it, enhance it, and control it. The critical emotional skills, intelligence skills are self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills. I will not dwell on these. There are plenty of books to read on the topic. I will tell you that these skills, skills do matter, as do the resulting behaviors. If we all work on improving our own inherent emotional intelligence, we not only raise our individual bars, but we will collectively improve our team performance as well. In closing, as we all know, we're in a period of transition. 
but when has that not been the case? Transitioning to new leadership happens all the time in our business. People come and people go. During my five and a half years in the Pentagon, I have served under four secretaries of defense and under seven undersecretaries for personnel and readiness, all in the same administration. Those of you in uniform change leaders routinely when you PCS. Those in power quickly become those without power. As the AMP AMSIS conference comes to a close, as the current administration comes to a close, as we contemplate our future, and to quote Bram Keeler, be well, do good work, and stay in touch. Thank you. Morning, um, Dr. Geis said that we're going from great to small. I'm the small. Uh, my name is Captain Jolt Stockinger. I'm a Navy trauma surgeon. I'm the latest in a uh, line of uh, previous directors for the Joint Trauma System. I'm the current one. And as she said, leadership comes and goes, but the system continues on. I am very humbled to have been asked to uh, present at this plenary because obviously I'm not one of the 18 stars. But that said, what are the stars without a few stripes? So I'm the stripes. I'm here, I've been, I was asked specifically to talk about the military trauma care as a learning healthcare system. Before we do that, we have to talk about our disclaimers and disclosures. You've seen all of these multiple times before. I will continue on with them. But let's talk about a learning healthcare system. When I was asked to present this, I said, wow, what an honor. What is that? It's a buzzword. We've all heard lots and lots of buzzwords before. The term learning healthcare system has been around for a while, but I never really paid any attention to what it means. Fortunately, the kind folks at the Institute of Medicine actually published a very large tome in 2007 that's 374 pages that describes exactly what the components of a learning healthcare system was. And so I said, wow, I'd better read that before I give this presentation. Well, I'm a trauma surgeon, I have the attention span of a gnat, so I wasn't gonna read all 374 pages, but fortunately, the kind folks at the IOM, now the National Academy of Medicine, actually included a cheat sheet which describes all the characteristics of what a learning healthcare system is. And if you look at this list, this list isn't about really about stuff with the exception of a health record. It's about how things work together. It's about communicating, it's about evolving, it's about identifying problems and fixing them in a continuous fashion. So it's not about getting more stuff, it's about making stuff work together to produce a desired end result. So let's talk about how military health care, or specifically military trauma care during these recent conflicts, which are still ongoing, has demonstrated a learning healthcare system. Well, let's go back 15 years. In 2001, when this war started, we didn't field tourniquets. No one had a tourniquet. We didn't have hemostatic dressings. We didn't go to war with a trauma system. We didn't train trauma consistently or effectively at our MTFs or anywhere else for that matter, outside of basic corpsman or medic training. We didn't capture data from the battlefield or from deployments. We didn't do performance improvement when we deployed to austere environments, whether it's humanitarian operations or smaller conflicts around the globe. And we didn't really have an established battlefield standard of care besides what people were taught at the many different schoolhouses across the, across the military. That was 15 years ago. So you could quite reasonably argue that 15 years ago, the MHS went to war not prepared to go to war. Let's look fast forward 15 years. Looks like we've fixed most of these problems. We've got tourniquets, we have hemostatic dressings, we have much better trauma training, although that's still a work in progress. We capture combat casualty care data, so we now actually know what care is provided on the battlefield, and we have standards in place that direct what that care needs to look like to improve survival on the battlefield. And we involve all the players 
looking after those combat casualties in that process through weekly conferences, teleconferences, through electronic transmission of data, and so on and so forth. So in 15 years, we've done amazing things. In 15 years, so it took 15 years to get there. So how did we get there? Well, there have been a lot of reports over the last few years by independent bodies, including the GAO, the Micromac Commission, the um, IOM report that Dr. Geis referred to, this slide references the Defense Health Board report of March 2015, and they all say a lot of the same things, which is we went to war unprepared, but the focus of the unpreparedness was about a lack of communication and a lack of coordination. It wasn't about that we weren't sending good people downrange to do the job. It was that we weren't, we weren't getting everybody to work together as, as a group. We've all seen slides like this before. It looks great. It's the, quote, seamless continuum of combat casualty care. How often have you heard a phrase like that at military presentations talking about trauma care? Seamless continuum. Well, did we go to war with that? That slide certainly looks seamless because it's got all those different echelons of care in there from point of injury back to CONUS and including the VA. It's got the cute little arrows with the flying helicopters, or at least they'd be flying if I was an Air Force presenter. Um, that shows that things move the way they're supposed to move. Well, in 2001, when we went to war, did we have that? We had a slide that looked like that. We had all those elements in place that could do all of those things, but did they work together effectively as a trauma system and a trauma team? And I would argue, based on personal experience and everything I've heard in the last 15 years, that we really didn't do that very well up front. I'll give you a personal story from Iraq in 2004, 2005. I'm sitting in a dirty little tent in Ambar province wearing my Marine Corps uniform, and patients show up. I don't know where they came from. I don't know who treated them. I don't know how to contact the people who treated them. I would operate on them and send them to the Roll 3 in Balad or Baghdad. I wouldn't know what happened to those patients. And when I called the Roll 3 to ask what happens to the patients, because, hey, guys, you're not answering my emails, the response I got was, what do you want to know for? It's like, is there a problem with that? Yeah, there's a problem with that. So we clearly didn't go to war with that system in place. But now we've fixed that. The question is how? The first question is why? Why do we need to fix that? We've got, got all the pieces. And the short answer is we all recognize that systems work. Systems make things work together. And in the case of trauma systems, systems save lives. The civilian trauma system that we tried to model ourselves after in CENTCOM starting around 2004, 2005, was developed by military surgeons coming home from Vietnam. But we seem to have forgotten about that. And they built a civilian trauma system that's been proven to reduce mortality and morbidity with the implementation of systems. And the system isn't building new hospitals or buying new ambulances. It's getting everybody to work together and getting the right patient, getting patients to the right place and the appropriate amount of time to improve their care. And that's the part that really was missing from the military trauma system. It wasn't the stuff, it wasn't the people, it was the coordination piece. And we had to put that into place. Well, as we know, doctrine takes a long, 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 long time to change. And we're Americans, we don't wanna wait for that. So I love this quote, because it's from a Soviet advisor journal in Vietnam back in the day. And he basically said, the problem with Americans when you fight them is, they don't know their doctrine or they don't care about it and they just do what they want. So we're kind of hard to fight because we're very, very unpredictable. But it also means we're extremely adaptable. And Charles Darwin said it best, it's the adaptable that survive. It's not the strong, it's not the intelligent, it's the people who can change, who can go with the flow that survive. And in our particular case, going with that flow really does refer to the survival, to the continued staying alive of individual combat casualties. Because if we don't adapt our system to treat them, those patients do not survive. And that's why it was so critical to fix this. But how did we fix it? This is a kind of a complicated slide with a timeline on it that I'm not gonna dwell on in a lot of detail. If you're interested in the history of how our trauma system developed, Colonel Brian Eastridge, who was actually instrumental to the development of that system around 2004, will actually be presenting the history the, of the military's trauma system at a one o'clock uh, session later on this afternoon. But it was a lot of fits and starts, starting at a high level in launch duel, then the role threes, then the role twos, then the BASs, then the en route care, and then the medics. And it took literally years to get all of those pieces linked 
together. But after 15 years, it got linked together. So we've done a great job putting the system together. For those who have ever been bored by a JTS presentation, I have to include this slide. This is our operational cycle. And if you notice, this operational cycle, it's got the three pieces to it, but at the top it says trauma care delivery. What that means is clinical medicine. That means people looking after patients on the battlefield. That's what our system is about. It's about looking after the individual combat casualties. But the thing is, how do you know what's happening to that patient on the battlefield unless you can gather data? And whether that data is an electronic medical record or someone calling you and telling you what they did or they fill out their tactical combat casualty card or whatever, you need to know what the guys on the ground are doing so you can find out, are they doing it right? If not, can we teach them? If these guys are doing it right and those guys aren't doing it right, we can take that information and give it to these other guys and improve the system that we have, but that requires data capture. And so a DOD trauma registry that had never existed before was developed 10 years ago. And while, that's, and while you may say, okay, trauma registry, gee, gosh, that sounds interesting, it's important. And to give you an idea of how important it is, the Secretary of Defense awarded the highest civilian honor bestowable to a DOD civilian to the developer of that trauma system, doctor, uh, the, uh, the trauma registry, Dr. Marianne Spot, uh, just a few weeks ago in the Pentagon. So clearly the Secretary of Defense thought that the development of a combat trauma registry so we could track casualty care and make intelligent decisions on the basis of it, he thought that was very important. So we take that information, we figure out what works, what doesn't, we turn that into battlefield standards, and then it goes right back to the people who are providing that care on the battlefield. That's a system, and it's that cycle that really was missing when we went to war in 2001. We had people doing great things downrange, but they were doing it in isolation. We had people doing not so great things downrange, but they didn't know any better, and no one was teaching them. And this cycle helps solve that problem, and it standardizes care, and as Dr. Geist says, it raises the bar on combat casualty care to an unprecedented level in the history of warfare. Because we didn't know what we didn't know at the start of this war. Ron Bellamy in um, 1984 published a paper talking about why do people die on the battlefield from the Vietnam data. He found out that 88% of casualties died prior to reaching an MTF. Well, okay, so how were we doing? Well, it took, until, it took 10 years of war before we did that same analysis and look at how great our improvement was. We dropped from 88% to 87.3. Hmm, okay, that doesn't look right. Then the question becomes, why is that? Well, it's the same reason it always is. People bleed to death unless you do something about it. And our analysis showed that half the people who bleed to death and might have survived could have been relatively easily treated at the point of injury if technology and training had been available. And that's simp simply fielding tourniquets. So now we have a huge number of devices that combat medics and, I'm still gonna use the word corpsmen because I'm old, combat medics, and <laughs> combat medics and corpsmen can actually use that on the battlefield while they're still under fire to save lives. We didn't have that in 2001, but we realized how important it was. And now it is extremely rare for someone to bleed to death on the battlefield if they have an extremity injury. We fixed that problem, but we had to identify the problem existed through data capture and synthesis before we could do that. Another thing we discovered was, wow, the sooner you move a patient to a surgeon who's bleeding to death, the more likely they are to survive. That seems intuitively obvious to most people, that if your bucket's getting empty and you die when the bucket's empty, you know, you gotta patch the bucket. I mean, I'm a surgeon, so that's pretty obvious to me. But when you're arguing with a line commander who's saying, okay, um, I'd rather have an attack helicopter than a medevac helicopter and I don't have space for both, you gotta make that argument. That argument got made. In 2009, Secretary of Defense Gates said, there's gonna be a golden hour, like it or not, but the, the debate still continued because the data weren't there and now we have the data, published by uh, Russ Cotwell, former, uh, former regimental surgeon of the 75th Ranger Regiment, and he proved that that mandate saved 359 lives in the first five years of its implementation in Afghanistan alone. So we prove that it works, and that's the way doctrine gets changed, by putting numbers against your opinion so the system will change and preserve 
the right thing to do because it's been proven to be the right thing to do. The standards of care I've already addressed. We now have clinical practice guidelines to say how to treat battlefield specific injuries. And a lot of triple amputees outside of you know, rare instances like Boston, um, but they're pretty common on the battlefield. How do you treat those if you never see those in the States? We now know how to do that. We can train people how to do that. We track these CPGs and the performance improvement and we prove by tracking these things and tracking the compliances and ensuring the compliances that mortality and morbidity on the battlefield goes down. That's another example of a learning health system, but it took time to get there. That information also has to be transmitted back to the people who are providing care on the battlefield. And so if there's a change that shows up two or three months into deployment, how do people know about that? And the answer is, let's talk about it. So for 10 years, there has been a weekly trauma conference, a virtual trauma conference hosted by CENTCOM, run by the JTS, that discusses every major combat casualty that comes out of CENTCOM from point of injury through their current location. And the point of injury care is discussed by the medic who provided it, the en route care is discussed by the flight nurses who provided it, the surgery is discussed by the surgeon who performed it, all the way through and everyone talks about what works, what doesn't, what could be better, what could be worse. And sometimes things just can't be better because you can't get resources where they need to go. It's physically impossible and people need to understand that as part of the system as well. And all of these things in combination, along with a lot of other things like MRAPs and personal protective equipment and so on, have generated the lowest mortality in a major war in recorded history. The slide's a little bit confusing, but I want you to look at the red line and the green line. The red line is our kill in action rate, and the green line is the case fatality rate. Case fatality rate basically means what is your odds of dying if you are wounded on the battlefield? And you look at the left-hand side of that graph, and it was over 20% when we started this. That's the same as World War II. Look at the end of that graph, it's 6%, 7%, lower than any other war in recorded history. We've done a great job, but it took a long time to get there. And I'd make the, I'll give you the cautionary tale. It's the 21st century. We are the best resourced, smartest military that's ever existed on the face of this earth. What possible excuse do we have for not doing this well and for not doing better? We should never ever be satisfied at how well we're doing and say, okay, it's good enough. We don't have to do any better than this. We always have to do better than this. That's why we're in medicine. We want, always want to fix things. So let's look at that nice cheat sheet that the IOM gave us for learning healthcare system. And if you go through this list, I think we've checked most of the boxes on it. Now, whether that was by accident or by design, I'm not gonna get into that because that's a whole other discussion, but we've checked most of those boxes. The two boxes that we haven't really checked that, that you see there in red, public engagement, I'd make an argument that maybe we have checked that box because our public is not the public. Our public is the military. It's military healthcare and it's our troops downrange. And I think we've probably checked that box pretty well. And then there's my favorite one, the electronic health record checkbox. And I don't even wanna go near that particular item, but I'll just say that some things don't work in some places particularly well. So if your choice is, if you've got a small generator and your choice is to plug in your coffee pot or plug in your anesthesia machine, the electronic health record on the laptop is my choice number three for that one. All right, so what does the future hold for the trauma system? The expectation is we're gonna keep doing better, right? Because that's what happens on every war. So the next war that happens or the next war that is happening, we expect that little blue box on the right-hand side of the screen that shows that we're gonna do better. The thing is, historically, that's not what the box looked like. It's a red box. So what do we do to make sure that we get the blue box at the start of the next conflict? Because that's what our troops expect. That's what we expect. That's what our military medical leadership expect. And that's certainly what Congress and the American public expect. So how do we do that? The current generation of people coming into the military and the medical care providers coming into the military, they were embryos when 9-11 happened. And their deployment experience is fixed facilities, working in operating rooms that are probably nicer than the ones they have at home, and they think that's a deployment. And yeah, that's a deployment after 10 years of war. But this is what a deployment looks like 
when it starts. This is what a deployment looks like for years, and if you plan on being in and out again pretty quickly, that's your entire deployment, and the electronic health record is that note in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. So what we have now works really great for where we are now, but it's not gonna work for the next one. So how do we institutionalize that? How do we develop a trauma system to support that? Well, obviously the best way to, to predict the future is to go ahead and create it. And so our problem is, what's a trauma system gonna look like for a COCOM? Because every combatant command looks different. That's SAMC in San Antonio. It's not gonna look like a civilian trauma system. You know, it's hard to park to land a helicopter in the middle of the South American jungle. It's a lot easier to land it in the middle of the Iraqi desert, but there's no water there like the South American jungle. And we won't even get into the issue of the tyranny of distance when it comes to the Pacific where you're gonna to have to island hop, and the golden hour is somewhat difficult to accomplish. So what we have to take away from our learning trauma system is we need to put a lot of thought into how we're gonna do what we do before we have to do it. And since wars typically are forced upon us as a nation, as opposed to us deciding we're gonna have one next week, or next month, or next year, we need to do that planning now while we still have the option to do that. Otherwise, we're not gonna get the same result we get today. And with that, I have 35 seconds left. Thank you very much. Okay, um, good morning, senior leaders, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, Admiral Cowan, thank you for the invitation. Dr. Geis, senior leader sitting in the front row here and everybody. Uh, the views in uh, this presentation are mine and I have uh, no disclosures to make. Um, I do have a new title there I would mention and one of the goals of uh, my office as the functional champion will be to get the deployed electronic health record prioritized in front of the coffee pot in theater. So we're working on that. This is uh, the agenda for this morning's uh, presentation. And uh, you all, of course, uh, know these statistics about our military health system, but active duty service members, families, retirees and their families, uh, over 65, we have a relatively healthy population, as you know, and we have a direct care uh, and a purchase care system. But I want to talk this morning about um, this um, challenge before us about the relationship between volume of procedures and anything that we do uh, and morbidity and mortality. This slide speaks to the uh, relationship between volume and mortality. Uh, the first bullet at the top on the left talks about 20,000 pancreatic resections in a national cancer database and uh, where in this database they show that low volume hospitals have about a four times increased mortality rate um, when compared to high volume hospitals. That's one data point. The second one is vascular surgery and this is, this is a database that has 13,000 procedures that were carotid artery stenting. And they looked at this question about operator volume, does it make a difference when you're stenting a carotid artery and showed that higher operator volume uh, was associated with a lower rate of mortality and complications. And then the third bullet there on the left is, what is the impact of having a lung resection in the teaching facility? Uh, and what is the impact of uh, low volumes on lung resection? Again, a big database, over 13,000 patients, that showed that the 30-day mortality rate for patients who were having a big lung cancer resection was twice as high in a non-teaching facility as compared to a teaching facility. And again, there was a relationship between mortality uh, and the volume of procedures uh, that you did. So uh, these are interesting relationships that are published in the literature. Also on the right in the graphs, you see some uh, data from LeapFrog, Again, um, low volume uh, facilities uh, in the blue bar, um, higher volume facilities in the purple bar, and that relationship to operative mortality. 
So these are four examples of the relationship between volume and mortality. What about this question now that we're talking about minimum volume procedures? There are um, professional organizations that have addressed this. This top bullet on the left, the American College of Surgeons, has said if you're doing bariatric surgery, there will be some minimum volume standards. And uh, we will credential you or certify you as a bariatric center of excellence, but there are volume standards. The second bullet shows that some insurance plans are looking at volume, at, in Blue Cross in this case. And it's around surgery like transplantation, bariatric surgery, spinal surgery, and surgeries like that. And the third bullet I'm going to talk about again in the next slide is this um, volume pledge taken by these three healthcare systems, which has generated a lot of debate. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. And then on the right, again, some leapfrog minimum volumes, um, minimum surgeon volume per year. And you'll see, for example, 100 coronary artery bypass drafts. Um, and you'll see some other examples there on the right from leapfrog. This is what the volume pledge healthcare systems did. And again, a lot of debate here about setting mil, uh, minimum volumes. Some people might say, well, that's a blunt instrument. It's not as simple as a minimum number of cases per year. Um, there are risks from doing this. So for example, if you're a surgeon in a hospital and you're at 19 esophageal resections and you wanna get to 20 because that's the minimum volume, but you've got a choice. Maybe the patient's a better candidate for cryotherapy for his distal esophageal cancer or dysplasia. That might tip you over to do that 20th esophageal resection. So it can encourage uh, behavior perhaps that we don't want. Um, and you'll see the volumes here. Esophageal cancer there, I'll point out on the second line, pancreatic cancer, minimum volumes of 20 per year. Um, some healthcare systems do set minimum volumes, and they do um, have some of these big surgeries done in specialized medical centers. Can, uh, Kaiser, Medi Kaiser Healthcare System is an example of that. For low volume, high risk surgery, they say those surgeries will only be done at these specialized medical centers. Two examples are Whipple resection for pancreatic cancer and major esophageal resection. And if they need to fly patients to those specialized medical centers in the Kaiser system, they do. The other caveat they put on it is, if your surgery requires expensive medical, special medical equipment, like the robot, for example, you'll fly to these specialized medical centers or drive there to have that done. So they will purchase these expensive medical devices like the robot and put them in a handful of their medical centers. And this is just some data here. Um, this relationship is not crystal clear, the relationship between volume and outcomes. Uh, so it's not that easy. Here in the second column, column you see surgeon volume, volume. In the third column, you see hospital volume. Both are factors and outcomes that we need to think about. Um, the, set, the third row there where it says pancreatic cancer resection, I'll point out. Uh, in these studies, a strong relationship with mortality depending on the volume of the hospital. So, but you'll see a number here where the association is weak, both with the surgeon and with the hospital. So it, it's not a simple equation here. And as some of these associations are weak. It's, it's just not quite crystal clear um, uh, how this should be done and how we should do it as a healthcare system. Many of you have seen this this relationship between injury severity and case fatality rate, and Captain Stockinger was very articulate here, but how do we understand um, and learn from potentially survivable deaths on the battlefield? If we have a sentinel event in theater, much like we would in our garrison environment, how do we do a root cause analysis? And then how does our system learn from an event like that, knowing that it's imperfect information. We often don't know the tactical situation that's going on, so it's not perfect, but how does our system learn from that? The other, uh, I'm gonna tell two other stories here about a learning healthcare system. If I had a patient with an extremity injury in Baghdad, and that patient arrived at launch stool with a, fat, with a compartment syndrome, because I had failed to do a fasciotomy there in Baghdad, I found out about it right away, and I didn't make that mistake again. 
And I saw that happen also with abdominal compartment syndrome as well. So we have these internal feedback loops that allowed you to learn immediately from things, for things that could have been done better in theater. One other story, I was at a recent uh, meeting of the Tactical Combat Casualty Care. I'll tell you one other story about culture, and Captain Stockinger talked about this. Combat medic up in front of the room, 70, 80 people in the room, agencies outside, Department of Defense, um, surgeons in the room, researchers, et cetera, et cetera. But here's a combat medic in front talking about prolonged field care, 17 hours taking care of his patient in theater. How did he use plasma? How did he do pain control? How did he rotate the tourniquets because the patient had an extremity injury? And what he said at the end of it was, the worst thing that happened to my patient is he had urinary retention and I didn't have a Foley catheter. But by golly, I had a suction catheter and I had lubricant, but I didn't think I could have used the suction catheter to decompress his bladder. So my only, what was striking to me, my only observation is here is what is the environment we've created in that community that allow a medic to get up and talk about something that he could have done better in combat. That culture allowed it. He wasn't afraid of doing it. He wasn't embarrassed by it. No one stood up and said, how could you have let that happen in that meeting? So um, that's a very good culture. And I think Captain Stockinger talked about that too. Um, this is a, a slide here on the deployment effect, um, talking about skills eroding. We've had busy deployments, of course, but now we have these highly dispersed operations um, in austere environments, and it's low volume. These are low volume engagements. And uh, I spent a year as a research fellow. I didn't operate for a year at Boston University. I was uh, pretty nervous coming back from a technical and a cognitive standpoint about how I was going to be able to come back and operate when I was at Boston. So it's a, it's a real phenomenon here. And some good work was done by uh, uh, um, Colonel Deering and, uh, and his uh, colleagues there. And then here's another uh, striking study. I don't see the graph on the right there, but let's look at that graph on the left about mean annual operative cases. This is a study by Colonel Edwards, fabulous study right here. Um, and I'll, I'll hold up her article here. This is a 2016 article in the Journal of American College of Surgeons. Um, she says, de quoting, deployment of Army surgeons has not decreased, but it's increasing. Um, that's one. And she's also commenting on this powerful movement afoot to limit complex surgical cases to centers of excellence. So those were interesting comments um, there. Um, and here's another quote. More than 60% of deployed surgeons reported performing less than one operative case a month during their deployment with the busiest surgeons performing two cases a week. So that's not very busy in the current environment. So that's a very good observation. And then to this graph right here, if you look at uh, when surgeons apply to take their boards or to recertify, they submit the number of cases they do. This is Army surgeons in that left bar, 71 of them. Um, they reported an annual, annual case volume of 130 cases. This is all surgeons general and subspecialty surgeons in the Army. But if you look at American Abortive Surgery, just general surgeons in that middle column, their average annual volume was 533 cases. That's a 400 case difference. And then if you look at general surgery includes subspecialties, it's about 400 compared to 130. So this is a real phenomenon right there. I see that second graph also popped up there. That just breaks it out by specialty. But the American Board of Surgery surgeons are the green bars. You can see those high green bars right there compared to Army surgeons, which many of them are down around or less than 20 cases per year in those various subspecialties. So, so this was uh, some very good work done by Colonel Edwards. And I'll just uh, go to the end here, another quote that I like. As surgery becomes more subspecialized and technology dependent, the military must leverage its requirement for general surgeons who can function in these austere environments with limited communication, limited equipment, but return home with the expectation of a very high standard of surgical care for our beneficiaries that they deserve. Uh, and so this dichotomy is what we're wrestling with. Now this is another uh, interesting slide that I showed you. Um, I showed you the Johns Hopkins Dartmouth data and those procedures, those high-risk surgeries that they, uh, uh, they now set minimum volumes for. Well, we did the same thing with our data. Okay, we looked at our data. If you look across the top there, those are the 10 high-risk procedures that were being done. 
we said, hey, how are we doing with those 10 high-risk procedures in our healthcare system? Now, these are administrative data, so they're not outcomes, okay? Subject to the accuracy of the coding, uh, acknowledging that there may be other sources of cases for surgeons and teams, so it's administrative data. But if you look on the left there, um, what we've done there is put the minimums developed by Johns Hopkins against how many we did. And green means we exceeded that number of uh, uh, there uh, by whatever the minimum was. So the left three columns right there, knee replacement, hip replacement, bariatric surgery, we've got a lot of greens in there. We're exceeding those minimum volumes right there. But as you look across to the right at things like esophageal and pancreatic cancer resections, we've got ones or threes. So these are facilities the facilities are on the left here that you don't see. These are facilities that at least based on coded data with all of its failings, um, reported they did one esophageal resection or one pancreatic resection. And so what are our criteria for low volume, high risk? Do we have criteria as a healthcare system? How do we understand the safety of doing these procedures in our community hospitals? And look, Good triage decisions are being made every single day in our healthcare system. The surgeons, the teams, the command teams are making good decisions about where this care can be most safely provided. I believe that. Um, but too little of anything could be chemotherapy. It could be a bone marrow transplant. Patients with acute myocardial infarction doesn't have to be surgery, but it's this relationship between volume and outcomes. Now, these are some of our NISQIP data, the National Surgical Quality Improvement data. These are what we call our heat maps. We submit our data to the American College of Surgeons, and our data gets compared to the 603 hospitals that participate with adult NISQIP. Um, and uh, so these are what we call our heat maps. Um, the hospitals would be down the left. There were 17 of them in each of the services in the NCR. And then uh, the key here is you'll see exceed standards, which is a green box with a little asterisk in it, means that we are statistically better than the other 600 hospitals that are in the database. And then meet standards is within a statistical significance for what's in the database, and needs improvement is in red. So the point is we're comparing our surgical morbidity and mortality data to national benchmarks. We submit our data. This is some of the best available data. The surgical clinical reviewers in your hospitals are abstracting records every single day and submitting them to the American College of Surgeons. Some percentage of the cases that you're doing, 10%, 20%. Uh, so they're doing that, or all of them. Risk adjusted, so it corrects for the morbidities the patient has. But the bottom line finding here is just the kind of the reds and greens here. As you move from left to right over time, uh, there are fewer reds, fewer needs improvement. We are making improvements in the, in the quality of care that we give our surgical patients. So, so uh, this is a good information that we've looked at. Now, even better information is how are we doing on these 10 high-risk cases that Johns Hopkins is pointing out and saying, hey, there should be some minimum volume standards here. So we said, okay, let's go in the NISQIP database and see how we're doing. And you don't have to read those uh, tables right there necessarily, but we compared us ourselves to those hundreds and thousands of cases that are in that NISQIP database. And the bottom line here is kind of under takeaways. Our complication rates are similar to or slightly lower than those in this database. There's a couple of exceptions. Um, we're better in one case and, 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 and need improvement in another case, but in large part, our complication rates are similar or slightly lower in the MHS than they are in these hospitals that participate in NISQIP. And our survival rates are similar as well, or slightly higher. So now granted, this is a subset of our cases. We're not abstracting 100% of our cases to get to this information, but this is pretty darn good data. And so the point is, we weren't afraid to go and look at our own real data, the best of data we have available in the MHS right now. And oh, by the way, we are partnering with the American College of Surgeons, and it has been mentioned here, I co-chair the quality committee with a, uh, civ my civilian counterpart in New York City, but we have NISQIP and performance improvement experts on this committee from the civilian sector, Vanderbilt, Henry Ford, Ohio State, New York Presbyterian. They will make site visits, and we've made site visits to hospitals and talked with hospitals 
in our healthcare system about the quality of their surgical care and to just to give their perspective and thoughts on how to approach it. It's very valuable. But the point is the civilian sector is open arms willing to help us. And so it's been very good. I did want to point out this. Uh, this comes from the American College of Surgeons. Um, there are 60 hospitals on this slide. There are two circled in red. But there are 60 hospitals from among 603 that participate in the NISQIP database from among the probably four or 5,000 hospitals that could participate in the database if they wanted to, but they don't. So two of our hospitals were recognized for meritorious performance on composite quality scores. And you'll see the two of them there. On the lower left is uh, the hospital at Travis Air Force Base circled on the lower left, and then at the top of the second column is Eisenhower Army Medical Center with an asterisk, which by the way, shows that they have sustained excellence for two or more consecutive years. Eisenhower has sustained excellence compared to their civilian sector counterparts in surgical quality. That's pretty amazing. And how can we learn? Our challenge is how can we learn from Eisenhower? How can we learn from Travis? How can we learn from those hospitals? Is it the senior leadership? Is it the culture in the hospital? Is it the visual display of data? I've seen Eisenhower talk about their data. To them, it's pretty much routine business. Frankly, it's hard for them to describe what they're doing. They're doing it so well, it's become part of the way they do business, the way they display their data to the leadership. And their level of extreme transparency at Eisenhower is really very impressive. So how do we become a learning healthcare system with respect to these kinds of data? And you're familiar with these mitigation strategies. I'll, I'll just point out here that top one on facility capabilities, that's a that's another way to think about it. Um, you know, what is the capability of the facility? Um, do they have 24-7 coverage uh, with critical care trained nurses? I remember at Fort Leavenworth when I was a surgeon, I did have, I had a 72-year-old patient had a complication after a uh, colon resection and had atrial fibrillation with a high rate. I slept in the bed next to the patient. We had an ICU, but we didn't have 24-hour coverage with critical care trained nurses. It's essential. And so I also remember a case, the third bullet there under facilities, this concept of failure to rescue. This was actually in a medical center. It can occur in a community hospital or a medical center, but a surgeon had done a complicated gastric bypass on a Friday afternoon. Saturday afternoon, evening, little tachycardic, little tachypnic, temperature of 100.3. Hey, no problem, right? Surgeon wasn't notified. Sunday comes a little bit more. Monday morning septic shock with a blood pressure of 80 over 40. The outcome was not good. So failure to rescue can occur in a medical center the same way it can occur in one of our community hospitals if you don't have escalation protocols that notify those staff surgeons, hey, you know, Mrs. Jones isn't looking quite as good as we expected. What do you think? And she had a leak. And she had a leak. 20, that was detectable at 24 hours. We just didn't detect it. Right in an ICU, right in one of our medical centers. So um, anyway, and those bottom uh, ones there, you can, uh, you, you're completely familiar with those. The one other concept I wanted to show is uh, this concept of public transparency. This is knee replacement. Um, ProPublica has published a scorecard on this. So it's looking at hospitals in the national capital region. So you'll see the names of the hospitals there on the right. Some of them are familiar to you in Nova Fairfax, right near where I live. But they're naming the hospitals. And there are 26 hospitals here that do knee replacements on, uh, on the Medicare patients. Two of them had at least one surgeon with a low adjusted complication, right? You might, you might want to know that if you were having a knee replacement. You want, might want to know that information. But 10 of them had at least one surgeon with a high complication rate. You might, not want to, you might want to know who that is, too. You might want to know. But the point is they're naming hospitals here. Um, the other thing they're doing is naming surgeons. I blanked them out here, but there's names. John Smith. These surgeons are named by name. This is ProPublica doing this. They're named by name. So if you go to the second one, and they're showing volumes. Here's a surgeon who's done 426 total knees in the last year. And then if you go to the bottom, there's a surgeon who did it 27 times. So that's a pretty big difference right there. That's a pretty big difference. Now, if you look over on the right, if they're adjusted complication rates, they're all about in that medium range right there. So there's not that big a difference, even though the volumes are different. 
there's not that big a difference, but you know, there could be a difference. If you worked in a place where they did one a year, there could be a difference. So I, I just wanted to, to point that out. And then, you know, I, before I, actually before I go to this, I just want to point out one more thing here on surgical volumes. This is an article by Peter Pronovos um, in um, US News and World Report. But he was called by um, the wife of a patient who had esophageal um, surgery and died. And um, she was asking him, geez, you know, might my husband still be alive if he'd been operated on in this other hospital? Um, so why wouldn't we go to a safer hospital? We would. If we knew the volumes were good and the morbidity mortality is low, we would go. Um, she had gone to their public website, and the hospital they went to had better patient safety scores. So she didn't go to the medical center. She took her, hospital, patient, her husband to the hospital that appeared to have better patient safety scores. Turned out they had done one esophageal resection in the last year. That's not very many. Um, so it does call into question, what are the public data that we put out there? We're publishing our data in Department of Defense on health.mil. We've got our patient safety data, our quality data out there right now. Question is, you know, is it useful? Is it user friendly? Could you look at it as a patient and make a decision about which hospital you wanted to go to? So that's one question that came up. But this is not unique to the military health system. I'm working down uh, Dr. Pronovost's article here. He said in California, 63% of the hospitals that do esophageal surgery did just one or two in the last year. That's not very many. That's not the difference between 19 and 20. That's, that's the difference between 1 and 20 or 30 or 50. That's not very many esophageal resections. Same thing for pancreatic uh, cancer resections. So aren't patients, his point is, aren't patients entitled to know how many pancreatic resections, heart bypasses, pancreatic resections, their surgeons and their hospital have done in the last year, in the last two or three years? So he goes on at the end, he uh, say, hey, I don't want to overcomplicate things here. Again, it's not the difference between 19 and 20, it's the difference between 1 and 20. And um, wouldn't you like to know the hospitals and the surgeons that only rarely do something or do one of it a year? So he, his final statement here, and I'll quote, if hospitals aren't ready to impose a volume pledge, which he's taken a lot of heat for, frankly, um, there's no good excuse for all of us not to take a volume transparency pledge. Patients deserve to know the numbers. So next time you're having high-risk surgery, any surgery for that matter, ask your surgeon how many he or she has done and find out how many they've done in that hospital to support that surgeon. So this is a summary slide right here. Um, just summarizing here, professional societies are commenting on this, insurance plants are commenting. Some healthcare systems like Kaiser have made decisions about where they will do high-risk surgery. Not all of them, but some of, some of the high-risk surgeries. Um, and number two is exactly what Kaiser is doing. Um, but, you know, we've got the Merthyr Cancer Center. We've got other medical centers. We could do that. We could have specialized medical centers. I know, I know it, it's fearful to think about that in our GME programs and the experience of our staff and the need for readiness, but we could do that if we so chose. The third one there, factors other than volume play a role. I remember a case one time, I was a hospital commander, and the orthopedic surgeons had been beating on my door, we want to do total knee replacements. Now, we didn't have a joint trained surgeon, but by golly, we want to do total knee replacements. We'll get the joint surgeon down from the medical center. We know how to do it. It's technically an easy operation to do. We'll do it. So after some thought, I said, OK, I'll allow you to do it. Even though we were going to maybe do five or six a year, I said, OK, you do it. So they did the total knee replacement. The case went very well from a technical standpoint. The next day, the patient had a big deep vein thrombosis. Now, that's a recognized complication of a total joint replacement, no doubt about it. But as I stepped back from that, I'm like, mm, did the team really understand the necessity of aggressive deep vein thro thrombosis prophylaxis after a total joint replacement? I had to step back from that and say, mm, it's not just a surgeon, it's a team. It's a team, and I had to question my own judgment in allowing that to occur, even though the surgeons were saying, hey, technical, no problem, we got it. So 
There is increased uh, emphasis on public reporting, uh, and we'll see. We'll take that to our transparency group and see what we want. And of course, the last thing is the challenge that we have, the need to have a ready medical force on the one hand, which is essential, it's why we exist. Um, but on the other hand, ensuring patient safety, ensuring that preserving our, our, our um, training programs, docs, nurses, technicians, whomever it may be, all the members of our team, as well as uh, maintaining the cases here and procedures, and again, also applies to medicine as well, but enough of this to maintain the currency and competency of our staff providers as well. So uh, I thank you for your time today of just uh, posing that as uh, we've, we've worked on that, and I think done a lot of God, put a lot of good thought and work into that, and uh, there's more work to be done. Thank you very much. All right, now we have a break, and then when we come back, we're going to have the Surgeon Generals and the Director of the Defense Health Agency each do a 15-minute presentation, and then we're going to sit up here, and it's going to be your turn to ask us questions. So take a 20-minute break, and then please come back. <laughs>